Hello, and welcome to Engineering Ethics at NJIT. I'm your instructor, Daniel Estrada, and this is the lecture video for Lesson 14 on Technological Unemployment. Um, lesson 14 will be the final content lesson for this uh, semester. Um, there will be a final assignment, and I'll do one more video for Lesson 15, but that's really just a, a wrapping it up, what did you learn for the semester assignment. Um, lesson 14 will be the final content lesson where you'll have a uh, normal post and quiz, um, and uh, there's some reading material. Uh, that we'll go through. Let's go ahead and jump into the lesson. Um, right, so our theme this week is on technological unemployment. I have some readings from the textbook, uh, the Frey and Osborne paper from 2013 on the future of employment, um, which uh, really sets the tone for the recent discussion on uh, technological unemployment. Um, I have a quote from uh, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, I have a short video um, from uh, uh, the internet, uh, Humans Need Not Apply. I mean, I have some optional readings for you to go through. Uh, this lesson should it should be pretty short uh, and sweet. Uh, I, uh, there's a lot of material for you to go through, um, but I, I don't... Uh, I want to go pretty quickly through what I have to say. Uh, technological employment, uh, we're really just talking about the impact that automation... This is the third part of our AI discussion, and we're really just talking about the impact that automation, robotics, artificial intelligence has on the economy uh, and on the labor market in particular. So uh, when people talk about technological unemployment, um, they're usually talking about you know, robots taking their jobs. So one example of this is going to be something like these kiosks that you see at a McDonald's, uh, what were formerly uh, cashiers that you would give an order to are now computer screens that you uh, punch in your order um, and uh, they take your money and everything. Um, and then your food is still made by a person, at, at least for right now, um, but uh, the cashier job is being taken over by a, a machine. Um, here's another example of uh, technological automation. Sorry, uh, here's another example of technological automation. Uh, this is the uh, Amazon warehouses. Uh, you probably know that Amazon warehouses are mostly automated. Uh, back in 2013, right at the start of the technological or the recent uh, AI uh, boom, uh, Amazon purchased Kiva, Robot uh, Kiva Systems, Kiva Robotics, um, which is this robotics company that builds these little uh, uh, platform robots that can carry these shelving units that populate the floor of an Amazon warehouse. So there's not people walking around the warehouse floor, there's a bunch of robots carrying these shelves. It's all, auto it's all automated so the robots can control themselves and not crash into each other. Um, they can coordinate amongst themselves. Yeah, this is Kiva Systems. Uh, Amazon bought them for something like a billion dollars, or something close to a billion dollars. Uh, it was a huge uh, early move in the recent AI um, uh, economy, and it's, it has a big impact, right? So th these jobs might have been done by a person walking up and down these aisles. Um, it's more efficiently done by these robots, uh, and that means that you don't have to hire people to do the job. It's done more quickly. It can be, you can do it for 24 hours a day. Um, uh, the um, uh, fewer people uh, is cheaper, right? People are expensive. You have to pay them uh, lots of money, and plus uh, uh, benefits and so on. Um, and Amazon trying to cut costs uh, automates all its factories. Um, so if you've bought uh, an Am a product from Amazon, your product was shipped to you uh, partly by robot. Um, uh, Amazon is doing the same thing with uh, grocery stores now that are uh, automated, uh, uh, so you don't need to talk to a cashier. Um, there are people who work at the Amazon warehouse, but they're like monitoring the robots. Um, there is this final stage, so these robots all move up to the part p uh, picker, um, and the picker's job is to look at the screen, uh, determine what object needs to be grabbed from the uh, the bin. Um, sometimes these objects are oddly shaped or uh, like fabrics. Um, which are difficult for robots to grab precisely. Um, so the human, this is the last thing that a human needs to do, is, is grab the part from the shelf, um, and then the robot takes it back into storage. Um, uh, and Amazon's been trying to automate, uh, tr uh, has been holding a contest every year, trying to automate this last stage uh, that the human um, is doing a job. Um, here's one we'll last with... example, oops, uh, one more example of uh, technological automation. This is at an uh, orchard supply store, like a hardware store. Um, so they have an automated service robot that you Church can come talk robot to. robot helper, what are you looking for today? The robot will come up to you and will say hi. What can I help you with? Where can I find more of these? I'm looking for hammers. Me gustaría comprar esto. Can you place the object in my viewfinder? 
is this the item you are looking for? Yes. I'll take you. Once you show the robot the item, it will then navigate you to where that item can be found. The robot has a multiple sense. Okay, so so this is uh, sort of... Um, then... Oops. Uh, uh, sort of um, low-wage service labor, like working in a department store um, um, or working at a hardware store. Uh, customer service. Uh, labor. Um, it's not typically high wage labor. This is high. This is a high skilled labor. This is sort of low skilled labor. Um, uh, but it's it's increasingly automated, um, so that fewer people are walking around the the service floor. Uh, okay. Um, so these are the kinds of things that people think about when we talk about technological automation. Um, and uh, thinking about these things, uh, these all look like low wage, uh, sort of low skilled labor, uh, minimum wage labor, and. Uh, People, uh, so the first thing to say is this is a big political issue. Um, it's it's an economic it's an econo economic issue that means um, lots of money at stake. Um, recently in California, there was a, a successful move to uh, raise the minimum wage over the next few years to fifteen dollars an hour. Um, fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage uh, received a lot of blowback from the businesses who operate in California, uh, claiming that uh, the uh, an increase in minimum wage would uh, cut into their costs, and so it would; uh, those costs would get taken out in other places, uh, probably not to the consumer. So that means that uh, uh, the labor market would get hurt, and things like um, uh, these, these kinds of jobs would be automated. So if, if you want to raise the minimum wage, then those minimum wage jobs would be um, increasingly automated. Um, now, uh, this is a, a politically sensitive issue because there's a lot of money at stake, um, also because there's people's lives at stake. Um, and uh, it's important here to uh, maybe uh, counteract a uh, uh, stereotype or um, sort of maybe a, a yeah, stereotype that people have about minimum wage earners. So there's about 1.8 million workers who make at or below minimum wage. Um, this is uh, current uh, Bureau of Labor statistics. Um, uh, 1.8 million workers uh, at or below minimum, wa minimum wage. Um, a little over half a million workers make exactly at minimum wage, and the rest make below minimum wage. Uh, um, about half of those workers are 25 or less. Um, and so the the stigma is that minimum wage workers are young, uh, part time employees, uh, probably in school, in college, or. Uh, in high school and does the job after school to make extra spending money. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the stereotype is that, uh, that these workers have other sources of support and income, like they live with their parents, and so they don't need this money to survive. They're just using this money because it's nice to have uh, extra money. Um, so, so this is a stereotype, and if this, is, if this is what you think minimum wage workers are, if you think they're, they're uh, uh, mostly teenagers working part-time, after school, um, then maybe it's not so bad if these jobs get uh, automated. You know, maybe kids don't have a, a job, a first job to work, but uh, that's that's not so bad. Um, but uh, in reality, um, not all workers who are earning minimum wage are uh, teenagers working after school. Um, about half of them are over 25. Uh, so the average age of a minimum wage worker is about 35. Um, 88% are not teens, 36% uh, are 40 or older, 56% are women, 28% uh, uh, have children, uh, and more than half are working full-time. Um, so sometimes that's not working just a single job full-time. Um, it's often the case if you're working minimum wage, you're working uh, part-time, and so uh, working full-time means working more than one job, uh, maybe two, job, two minimum wage jobs uh, to make end, ends meet. Um, on average, uh, minimum wage earners earn half of their family's total income. Um, so these uh, workers tend to be earning uh, for the survival of their family. And automating these jobs uh, would have a big impact on the economy, on their lives. Um, but another thing to say here is that it's not just the low-wage jobs that are getting automated. So there's all sorts of jobs that are um, automating, to some extent, uh, high-wage high or high-skill labor. Um, a good example of this is Do Not Pay Bot. Um, Do Not Pay Bot came out a couple of years ago uh, with a service that lets you contest or appeal your parking tickets. So if you got a parking ticket and, and you don't think it's legitimate, there's paperwork that you can fill out to contest it. Um, and uh, Do Not Pay Bot, it just asks you a couple of questions um, to help you fill out these forms. 
Um, filling out these kinds of forms, this is legal work or like a, a legal professional work. Um, sometimes this costs a lot of money. Um, usually for parking tickets, it's not worth the cost. Uh, and most people don't know how to fill the paperwork out themselves. So most people just don't contest these tickets. They just pay them. Uh, and for a lot of people, they don't have to pay them or the ticket is illegitimate. And if they just knew how to contest them, they could. So Do Not Pay Bot helps people uh, contest these tickets. It's done it successfully for hundreds of thousands of people. Um, contesting millions of dollars worth of uh, of tickets um, successfully, and so so this is this is this isn't really taking work from lawyers because lawyers usually wouldn't be hired to do this work in the first place, um, but it's extending uh, legal services to people who otherwise wouldn't have access, and you can imagine this sort of uh, more encroaching on professional. Uh, work like filling out paperwork uh, uh, is sometimes a high school your accountant does the same thing when they file your taxes and so on and you pay them a lot of money for that um, uh, same thing with lawyers um, robotic surgery and healthcare um, there's all sorts of examples of uh, improved uh, uh, use of AI and robots to uh, do better surgery I have a couple of videos of robot surgery uh, but also to do things like cancer screening and so on um, Right uh, again, this this isn't exactly replacing a doctor's work, but it's um, augmenting the doctor's work. Uh, uh, maybe uh, requiring fewer doctors or fewer, um, uh, you know, double double checks from other doctors. Right, if you have, you know, maybe one doctor uh, make a call and then like three other doctors double check them. Uh, maybe instead you have one doctor make a call, another doctor check it, and then an AI uh, give a, 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 a final uh, look over. Right, so this way you need f uh, fewer doctors. Um, again, this is high-skill, high-wage labor that uh, sort of gets um, eaten into. Um, um, things like hiring decisions. Uh, one thing I talked about in the original AI lecture is this uh, uh, sentencing software. So this is uh, sentencing software to help a judge sentence criminals. Um, again, this is the kind of labor that's uh, high skill labor. This is the la uh, labor of a judge, which is um, high, high wage, high skill labor. Um, so it's not just the low skilled labor that's getting automated. It's also this um, uh, high skilled labor. Uh, one other example is in education. So uh, distance education, like most of the students taking this class online, uh, distance education through some online platform like Moodle um, allows an instructor to um, oversee the work of a lot more students than they would be able if they were grading this all by hand uh, on paper, um, maybe having to go into uh, classrooms for lecturing. Um, the fact that I can record a video and the fact that a lot of the work is automated by the software means that I can grade hundreds of students a semester instead of uh, maybe just uh, uh, 50 or 75 or something. Um, so I have a job, but the same work that I do would formerly have to have been done by maybe several teachers. And so f there's fewer jobs, f fewer people need to be hired to do the same work. Um, this is a, it's a little bit difficult to automate my job directly. Um, and we'll see in a second that my job is judged as low risk of labor, uh, low risk of automation. Um, but in some sense, the automation has an indirect effect because you have have to hire fewer people to do the same amount of work. So there's uh, there's some automation there. Um, yeah. So uh, what I'm talking about here is the Frey and Osborne paper. This is from 2013. Uh, Frey and Osborne. Um, what they do is they go through a bunch of different labor categories and they classify them as being low risk for automation, high risk for automation, or medium risk for automation. Um, so there's uh, several categories here that are at high risk of automation and very likely to be uh, computerized, automated, um, in the next 20 years, I believe. Um, and then there's a few jobs that are very low risk. I um, mean, they go through and classify all these jobs. From their classification, they estimate that 47% uh, of total U.S. employment is at risk of automation. So in other, in other words, that 47% of the jobs that are done now uh, will be done by a machine um, in the uh, uh, relatively near term. Uh, so they have this nice little chart uh, that... Uh, shows this. Um, if you go to the paper itself, which is one of the required readings, um, at the very end of the paper they have this big appendix. So after the after the bibliography, they have an appendix, and the appendix gives um, the probability, uh, the likelihood of being automated. Um, 
Because recreational therapists have the least likelihood of being automated choreographers, sales engineers, dentists, podiatrists. Um, so, you, so very low, very low likelihood of being automated. They have some formula. If you go through the paper, they talk about the exact formula they use to calculate uh, risk of automation. If you go through um, actors have a 37% chance of automation. So it's relatively low risk, but it's higher than um, recreational uh, attendance. So uh, funeral attendants, uh, mine shuttle car operators, um, relatively low risk of automation. Let's jump up here. Uh, librarians, high risk of automation. Computer support specialists, high risk of automation. Cutters, trimmers by hand. Uh, healthcare support workers, geoscientists, tapers have above 50% uh, motor boat operators. Okay, um, so you can. So uh, the list is kind of interesting. Um, you can go through the list and uh, see if um, your risk of automation. There's also this tool online on the BBC um, that looks at uh, likelihood of uh, taking your job. So you can put in, uh, for instance, let's say a chemical um, engineer. No, uh, well, let's look at it. Uh, mechanical engineer. Let's say. Uh, mechanical engineer quite unlikely 13% risk of automation automation so very unlikely um, how many uh, 66,000 this is uh, UK statistics um, we can maybe do one more uh, civil engineer uh, very unlikely 2% so even less likely than the mechanical engineer um, yeah uh, so uh, these statistics are a little bit interesting. Uh, you can look at uh, the risk of automation. Uh, it might interest you. Um, I mean, here's another uh, graphic that I uh, like in this discussion. This is from NPR in 2015. This is a uh, animated graph showing the most common job in every state. Uh, this is uh, the graph there is just for illustration. I can show you here. It's it's interactive, so you can uh, move the slider around. So um, in 1978, you can see the most common job in every state. Uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. Yeah, no. Uh, so the most common job in every state. Uh, a lot of secretarial work. It's the most common job. A lot of farming work. A lot of machine operator work. Uh, um, and as we go, for, this, this is 1978. As we go forward um, into the 90s, um, you see secretarial work almost disappears. Um, and obviously, the reason for this is the computers. Uh, computers uh, automate a lot of the functions of uh, secretaries. Um, word processing um, is a labor-intensive task if you don't have a computer to do a lot of the um, repetitive parts of it. So back in the 70s and early 80s, there were a lot of people employed as secretaries. Right? This is the most common job in every state. Uh, a lot of people employed as secretaries. Um, and as we get into the 90s, secretaries uh, disappear. Um, farmers also disappear. So do all the machine operators. You know, We used to build stuff um, here in uh, the United States, um, but those jobs go away. I um, mean, they get taken over by uh, truck drivers. Um, so for for most of the early 2000s, the most common job, the job that employed most people uh, in these states is truck driver. So you can see a lot of the farming jobs go away. Um, this is 2014, the most recent data uh, for this graph. Uh, farming jobs are almost entirely disappeared. Secretarial work is still the most common job in New Jersey. Um, um, one of the jobs that wasn't here before is software developer. So in uh, Colorado, Utah, in Washington, uh, Virginia, uh, software developer becomes a, a major employer. Um, this is a new job that wasn't here in the 70s or early 80s. Um, it starts to show up in the uh, 90s or so, but it becomes a, a major economic factor um, by 2014. So, but you can still see the truck driver is still the most common job in every state. And uh, as you know from our discussion of automation, uh, that these jobs are also going away. So uh, trucks, successful automated trucks um, have already been built, um, have already been deployed. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of fully automating a lot of these truck driving jobs. Um, in the near term, the big trucks that are uh, automated will still require a supervisor that sort of sits in the truck and make sure that everything is going smoothly. But as these trucks get better automated, that supervisor is going to have to do less and less. It's basically on autopilot. Um, uh, so truck driver is not a high wage 
or high skill job, um, but it's a very common employee job. Um, you need some skills. You need a license to drive a truck, uh, but um, um, the barrier for entry there is not very high. So a lot of people have this job. Um, we use truck driving quite a lot. But if this job gets automated, all these uh, all this work goes away. Um, the labor market has to adjust. Okay, so. Um, uh, so I want to start uh, some of this discussion with a uh, history lesson. Um, in particular, I want to talk about the Luddites. So the Luddites were a political activist movement in the early 1800s uh, who were reacting against um, the industrialization and the automation of factories in the early industrial age. So remember, early in uh, industrialization involves the process of urbanization before industrialization in the early 1700s um, uh, most people lived in farms most people it was a uh, agrarian community uh, most people lived uh, on a farm that they worked themselves um, but once factories get invented and the uh, uh, industrial age takes off in the early 1800s people move from the farms into the cities um, and city life contains all sorts of new uh, hazards uh, Health hazards, cities are dirty, and uh, lots of diseases. Um, they're, uh, yeah, they're unhealthy. Uh, and you have to work in these uh, factories that are sometimes unsafe. Uh, you have to work long hours. Uh, there's no protections. Ch children are working long hours or in uh, uh, dangerous conditions. Um, we've seen in this class uh, the kinds of dangerous conditions that, uh, that can exist um, in low-regulation environments like this. Um, the early industrial era was uh, human tragedy, and uh, so it was already pretty miserable in the early industrial era. Uh, alcoholism became rampant, part partly to just cope with the trauma of the age. Um, but in addition to uh, uh, it being terrible, uh, people worked at these factory jobs, and people were still very expensive, and factory owners... Uh, we're constantly looking for ways of automating the uh, the procedures in the factory to uh, require fewer employees. Employees are always a huge cost in any economic endeavor like this. So um, uh, the more you can automate, the, the cheaper the overhead um, and the better for the business. Um, and that means that even very early in the industrial era, uh, there were already threats of automation and reactions against it. So this is the Luddites. I uh, didn't want their jobs being taken by these machines, so they would break into factories and destroy the machines. They would go in with hammers and just uh, uh, crush the machines so they couldn't operate. And the idea is that if you can't, if the machine's not going to operate, then you have to hire the people. The Luddites thought that there was a moral obligation to hire people because people have to feed themselves and their families. A machine doesn't have to feed anyone. So how can you give this job to a machine who doesn't need the job uh, versus a person who does need the job? Right, so breaking these machines was a political act. It wasn't that they were afraid of the machine. I mean, it wasn't that they were afraid of the machines directly. They were they were afraid of the impact that the machines has on their jobs. Right, so this isn't a Terminator fear. This is a uh, that, that that the people have been made irrelevant fear. Um, in response to this, just maybe to tack on to my robot rights discussion, uh, in response to the Luddites' uh, attack on these machines, um, Parliament in the UK passed the Frame Breaking Act, um, which. Uh, made the destruction of factory machines a capital punishment, uh, which means punishable by death. So it became a capital punishment to to attack machines. This is maybe some of the first legal protections of uh, of machines. And it's really not protecting the machines. It's really protecting the property of the owners of these factories. The Luddites were workers who were fighting for their livelihoods. Um, uh, so this is an old, old, old problem, right? Technological automation is not something that happened because of the computer. Technological automation, I mean, the computer brought about its own round of technological automation, but technolo technological automation has been uh, a factor f from the beginning of technology, and especially in the industrial age, right? I mean, consider the automobile. Um, uh, cars have been a great economic boost to the United States, but it also involves a huge transition in the economy. Before cars, we had horses. 
Um, and there was a whole economic infrastructure for managing horses, for caring for horses, for teaching people how to ride horses and care for horses, for making things for horses like saddles and so on. Um, and all of that work goes away or most of it goes away um, with the invention of the automobile. And we've already talked a little bit about how the automobile changes uh, roads and uh, changes the shape of cities and so on. Right, so people uh, react to this, and it's important to understand from this history, I, I'm not advocating for the Luddites um, at all, I'm, I'm definitely not a Luddite myself. Uh, nowadays, the term Luddite tends to be used uh, to describe someone who's anti-technology, or who's anti-technological change, or reactionary against technological change. Um, the Luddites weren't against technology, the Luddites just thought that they deserved their jobs, and the factories uh, weren't being fair to them by making these big machines and giving their jobs over to these machines. So the Luddites weren't themselves anti-technology, but this image of people destroying machines uh, comes uh, down to us in the present day, where the term Luddite, is, it's usually a slur used against people who are critical of technology. But part of the lesson I want to get from this is that our, the modern way we conceive of work, uh, the idea that you should be working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, um, you should clock in, clock out, um, right. This is an entirely uh, recent notion. It's uh, particular to the industrial age. Before the industrial age, we were farmers, and farming work, it's not eight hours a day. Um, it's not 40 hours a week. There's not really a, a need for things like weekends in the farming world. Uh, I mean, you still have to milk your cows on the weekends. Um, uh, so... So the way that we conceive of work now, 40 hours a week, uh, it's optional and it's fairly recent. This is not like baked into what it means to be human. People haven't always worked 40 hours a week. And in fact, in, in some sense, you really can't work 40 hours a week. Your, your brain doesn't uh, have the capacity to put in that many hours. Um, you, you can put in maybe 20 hours of good work a week, and the rest of it you're kind of fudging or uh, uh, not doing very productive or high-quality work. Um, this is why people sort of futz around on Facebook uh, uh, during their work hours. Um, it's not really because they're lazy, maybe some of that, but it's also just because their brains can't take eight focused hours every day. That's uh, uh, 40 hours a week. And, and by the way, not everyone works 40 hours a week. Uh, in fact, a lot of people, most people uh, work, I don't know if it's most people actually, um, a lot of people work significantly more than 40 hours a week, and it's not just in order to make money. Some of the highest paid professionals work significantly more than 40 hours a week. A doctor or a lawyer uh, tend to work 60 or 80 hours a week. Um, um, this is not because they need the money. This is because uh, their job uh, sometimes demands it or the, the job culture, the culture around the job encourages people to work these long um, uh, hours. Um, but in the early industrial era, there were no labor protections whatsoever, and people were working uh, 12, 14, 16-hour days. Um, they were working uh, uh, seven days a week. Um, children were working. Uh, um, so people had to fight. Workers had to fight. Uh, literally fight um, in the sense of uh, violent acts against machines, um, in the sense of labor riots. Uh, workers gave their lives. Um, in order to secure uh, or, uh, labor rights, uh, uh, rights to organize, um, rights for safe working conditions, um, rights for limits on how much they're expected to work. Right, an eight-hour day is something that we fought for. Right, we demanded. Right, before uh, before industrialization, the eight-hour day, day didn't make any sense. Um, in early industrialization the expectation was that we'd have to work for more than eight hours. So in early industrialization, uh, the possibility of an eight hour work day, 40 hours a week, um, was something to aspire for. It was a, it was a political plank that you would argue for. You would chant it, um, uh, chant it during protests and stuff until, until it was actually won, right? We won the right to an eight hour work day. And if we won this right in early industrial era, well, the, the world's different now, right? It's, uh, 2018, when I'm recording this, um, the world works uh, differently, and maybe we need to start demanding uh, different things. Uh, maybe we need to start having different expectations for what it means to work in the modern era, right? So uh, there are people today who react against robots taking our jobs. 
Um, they want to say that we, we ought to have those jobs because we need to make money. What are we going to do if there are no jobs left for us? But maybe the alternative is instead of saying that robots shouldn't take our jobs, maybe the alternative is to say that we, sh we shouldn't have we shouldn't have a social system that requires us to have jobs right why do we need a job in the first place so this is this buckminster fuller quote buckminster fuller was a sort of public intellectual um architect uh in the early 20th century um he's the guy that designed those geodesic domes like the um the epcot center in disneyland uh, the epcot center was built on buckminster fuller's designs partly because it was emblematic of the future. This is what people in the 50s and 60s thought the future would look like, uh, partly as a result of Buckminster Fuller's um, discussions. So uh, 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 there's a famous quote. He's talking about the future of labor. He says, so we should do away with the absolute specious notion that everyone has to earn a living. It's a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. The youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing this nonsense of earning a living. We keep inventing jobs because of this false idea that everyone has to be employed at some kind of drudgery because, according to Malthusian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. So we have inspectors of inspectors and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. The true business of people should be to get back to work, I'm mean, sorry, get back to school and think about whatever it was that they were thinking about before someone came along and told them they had to earn a living. All right, so Buckminster Fuller's argument here is that um, it's not that we should have the right to the job, but if the technology can do the work for us, if the technology can produce all the things that we need, then why do we expect people to have a job? Right? Why do we have a social system that demands people have a job? There's this uh, notion, this Malthusian Darwinian notion, that if you can't earn your rights, that if you can't earn your living, then you might not have a right to exist, or that, you know... Uh, uh, you know, you make it difficult to be poor, so that w that it way in it encourages people to do to do work in the economy. Right? If you don't encourage people to do work in the economy, then they'll just sit around and drain on the economy. Um, and uh, right, and, and we don't want leeches. Right? This is the uh, this is the criticism. But if the technology allows us to provide for everyone without having to do the labor, then these people aren't being leeches, or at least they're, it's not. Uh, detrimental, right? P people, as, as many people can leech as they want, and the technology can take care of it, right? So this is uh, this discussion of uh, post scarcity, right? The idea is that uh, the economy uh, uh, that we work on operates on scarcity. That some things are scarce or uh, difficult. Your labor is scarce. We, uh, it's it's difficult to do certain jobs, and so um, your labor has value because of that scarcity. Well, if everything can be automated, then that labor is no longer scarce. Um, so this is a post-scarcity environment. Not, not that everything is super abundant, but that the framework of value can't rely on scarcity anymore. So um, instead of demanding that robots not take our jobs, maybe we should be demanding um, uh, the opposite. Maybe we should be demanding full automation. Um, so this is this discussion of the post-work future, um, what the future of work looks like in a fully automated world, in a post-scarcity world. So on this uh, Philosophical Disquisitions blog, um, there's some discussion of this um, Inventing the Future book. Um, uh, and the blog sort of boils the book down to making these four demands of the future of labor. So uh, full, automation, full automation as a political goal Right, full automation not as something that's that should be scary to workers, but as something that should be a relief to workers. Now we don't have to give up eight hours of a, of our day uh, over to the system um, in order so that I can build whatever widget for whatever factory I work in. Right, if the robot can do that job, then maybe I don't ha I don't need a job in the first place, and that means I'm free to do whatever I want. Um, right, so this this isn't a scary thing. This is a liberating thing. This is something that we should be working for. This is a goal that we should. Uh, be demanding. Um, uh, automation is a good thing. Uh, the second demand, maybe we demand a shorter work week, right? So if uh, maybe uh, people still work, but they just don't work as much. Instead of a 40-hour week, maybe a 35-hour week, 30-hour week. Maybe you work four days a week, eight hours a day. Um, 
working fewer hours means that uh, maybe some of those jobs can get spread around among more people. Um, uh, and this might ease the transition to full automation. Um, another way of easing the transition to full automation is universal basic income. Uh, this is uh, sort of popularly uh, talked about. Uh, universal basic income is just the idea that we just give people money. Uh, uh, without stipulation, just everyone gets you know $1,000 a month, say. So $1,000 a month, uh, it's, a, it's a nice bit of money. It's nice to have $1,000 that you, that you didn't have before. Um, it's not a huge amount of money, and you can't uh, quite live on $1,000 a month. It's not going to pay rent for you. Um, I mean, depending on where you live, it's not going to pay rent and food and so, and so on. Um, but it'll help, um, especially if you're not making very much money. It'll maybe put take some of the pressure off. Uh, um, maybe it'll also make you more comfortable with working less hours or working uh, uh, or, or otherwise adjusting your sort of economic output. Um, so you give some assistance to the low-income earners. Uh, to, uh, basic income takes some of the pressure off of technological automation. Uh, there's worries about universal basic income. There's a couple of worries about universal basic income. One worry is how do you pay for it? Uh, do you just raise taxes? Um, one suggestion that's floated around is that there's some uh, special robot tax. So if your company is investing heavily in automated software that would have formerly been done by a person, then maybe there's some special tax on those companies. Uh, first of all, so that disincentivizes companies to go to automation, right? It, it puts an additional financial barrier to full automation. Uh, and that maybe slows it down a little bit, puts the brakes on a little bit. Um, and then you can use this to pay for universal basic income and uh, otherwise compensate for the change, changing economy. Um, universal basic income uh, has a lot of pilot programs. Um, I, when I'm recording this just recently, the program in Finland was not approved for uh, continuation after two years. They did two years of it, and it was up for renewal, and they, the government decided not to renew it. Um, and this is making everyone concerned that maybe uh, universal basic income isn't a great solution. Uh, but there's still studies being done about this. One critique that's often raised is maybe we don't need income, maybe we don't need the money itself, uh, but maybe the be it's better to offer like services. <coughs> so like people are guaranteed access to certain uh, medical services, or you know maybe uh, maybe access to food and other kinds of resources. Um, so instead of just getting hard cash, um, the problem with this is that uh, the services. Uh, line might end up controlling what people do and what people use. Um, and this is often what's done in, in these uh, cases of uh, welfare or other kinds of public, uh, public services. Um, people often have this worry that the people who are getting these income, this income, this additional income, or um, are receiving these services are spending it illegitimately, they're spending it on uh, uh, bad things or things that aren't helping them get out of the situation that they're in. Um, so there's uh, often attempts to control what people do with the money. Um, there's plenty of studies that show that when you just give people money, they tend to spend it on what they need, like food, like medical services, like educational resources, textbooks, and so on. Um, so uh, people don't s s tend to spend this money frivol frivolously. Um, but nevertheless, there's this sort of constant uh, pressure uh, in capitalist systems like ours uh, on uh, the, the poorest uh, uh, people. There's this pressure. Again, the idea is that if you put pressure on them, that incentivizes them to work. Um, so this is another thing that uh, the post-work discussion is advocating against, is sort of devaluing this work ethic, this um, impetus that everyone needs to work. So the Buckminster Fuller quote is an example of this, uh, sort of undermining the um, the idea that everyone um, uh, needs to work. I, I have maybe more things to say about this in, in a second, but so what are some other solutions to uh, automation or, or reactions to automation? What, what do we do about how automation is changing the labor market? Uh, Universal basic income is one solution. Um, another kind of solution that we already see uh, a lot of examples of is a sharing economy um, solutions. Sharing economy is where there's a sort of peer-to-peer -peer service 
um, through some networked app. The standard example of this is something like Uber, where uh, so Uber is supposed to be a sharing economy version of a taxi cab. So a taxi cab is uh, usually regulated in New York. There's the taxi medallion you have to get. Um, only a certain number of those go out uh, to people, and it's very expensive to get one of them. Um, and that way, the city can control who's driving a taxi, can control um, uh, uh, the standards of taxis and so on. Um, Uber is not a taxi service. Uh, Uber is an app that lets people share their own cars. So someone who's driving an Uber car, um, they own that car. That's their own car. Um, and uh, they're uh, technically a contractor for Uber. Um, so Uber just gives them the network service that lets, lets them find customers. Um, pick them up, um, and then Uber takes a, a a piece of the fare, and then the person takes the rest of the fare, um, and this uh, lets people earn money with their own car uh, without getting a medallion. Um, so Airbnb is another example of this. Airbnb is like a hotel uh, where people can rent out their own space as a hotel. Um, there's lots of these kinds of uh, sharing economy services. Um, and there's lots of issues with these kinds of services. Um, there's not very much regulatory oversight. Uh, there, like, so in order to operate as a hotel, right, there, ha there are certain sanitary standards. You know, there have to be inspectors that come by and make sure that things are safe, uh, where people are living, that things are clean, and so on. Uh, there is that oversight for hotels. Maybe the hotel industry isn't great about keeping to their standards, but there are standards um, in the hotel industry. But there are no such standards at Airbnb, so there's no one checking to make sure that these Airbnb places are safe, that they're clean. Um, there's no one checking to make sure that the Uber drivers are safe. Uh, I think you have to send in your driver's license in a picture, and I guess Uber might run a background check. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but uh, it's not the same kind of oversight as the taxi services. Now, uh, Uber uh, advertises this as an advantage of its system. Look, uh, we're sort of getting around the, the heavy regulatory um, um, overhead of these um, highly regulated industries like the taxi industry or the hotel industry. Um, so by getting around the regulatory environment, we're saving customers money, but we're also uh, allowing uh, drivers to earn more money. So Uber claims that the drivers, or at least used to claim that the drivers would make more money than the taxi driver um, r running the same hours. Um, but this claim is a little bit disingenuous because uh, taxi services provide other support for their drivers, also for their users. Um, uh, like the uh, taxi driver doesn't have to pay for their own gas or their own car repairs. But the Uber driver, because they own their vehicle, they're entirely responsible for uh, for um, repairs on their vehicles, and for paying for gas and so on. Um, and this is a hidden cost. It's a cost that's passed on to the driver. Um, and it's a cost that usually the drivers, um, uh, if they're not explicitly aware of, they might not anticipate entirely. They might not uh, be able to accurately judge how much um, those kinds of costs, right, wear and tear on the vehicle and so on, um, how much those costs uh, eat into their income. Um, so uh, in this case, the workers have little formal protection. They have to shoulder all these additional costs. Um, users are also exposed to additional risks um, from unclean conditions or unsafe conditions or whatever. Um, another impact of the sharing economy framework is that uh, people don't own things anymore. right? If, I, if you take a Uber everywhere, then you don't have to own your own car. You just use someone else's car. If you're uh, using Airbnb or couch surfing around, then you don't have to own your own house. You're just renting um, other people's houses temporarily. Um, and that means, right, so in an economic downturn, it's useful for people with uh, little financial means, like young people, like millennials. Um, it's useful for them to have access to these kinds of services, these sharing services. But it also means that they don't have a lot of uh, equity. They don't have a lot of uh, um, investments um, to build their own economic presence. Um, and this is going to have an impact on the economy in the future. This is uh, an important thing to be watching. So uh, sharing economy is sort of one way of compensating for this changing labor market. Um, if you know, we share things around a little bit better, uh, maybe that helps. Um, here's maybe a more radical solution. This is, this is uh, the idea of an att attention economy. The attention economy was suggested by Herbert Simon in the 1970s. Um, 
Simon says, in an, inform in, in an information-rich world, the wealth of information means a dearth of something else, a scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes. And when information consumes is rather obvious, it consumes the attention of its recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. Right, so the idea is that um, there's lots of things competing for your attention and you have the job of allocating your attention efficiently because there's only so many things that you can pay attention to. Right? So your attention is limited um, and that means that it matters where you pay attention. Um, so the idea is that uh, uh, in some sense attention is the only scarce resource. Um, informa uh, attention is the most important scarce resource. Right? So if everything else is scarce, attention is the one thing that you can't just you know, whip up a new batch of, right? you have a fixed limited amount of attention and it can only be distributed among so many sources. So um, one way of tracking value, instead of tracking value with um, dollars and wages, um, maybe we track value with the flow of attention, right? How people are spending their, uh, their time, their attention, their, uh, the energy that goes into attending to things. Um, uh, Simon talks about this in the 70s. This got sort of popular in the early web. Uh, it led to a lot of web design. So this sort of standard layout of a web page with you know, sort of two columns and the advertisements on top and so on. Um, this format was settled on after lots of research into how people's eyes move across a web page and you know, where people tend to focus. So this is a heat map uh, from eye tracking software. Where you wear this little headgear and it looks where your eyes are moving across the page. Um, and uh, the red places are where people tend to look more, and that's also where the advertisements go because that's where you want people to be looking, right? So, uh, the design of the web page is built on an understanding of how attention flows across the page, um, and because that's where the sort of value valuable spots in the page are. Um, here's another example of uh, the attention economy: um, how where we spend our attention shows us what we what we value. So um, one example or uh, manifestation of the attention economy is something like social media, where uh, you're putting out posts or pictures, right, um, tweets, uh, and you're competing uh, with all the other posts and tweets that everyone else sees. Um, and you're competing for not dollars. People aren't paying you for that. Um, you're competing for attention, uh, the engagement, right, their likes, their comments, their retweet, retweets. Um, this kind of engagement is where value on social media rests. Um, if you're a streamer on social media, if you're like have a, you have a YouTube channel, the amount of money that you get paid uh, is directly depends on how many people are watching, your view count, your uh, subscribers, um, how many subscribers you have. All right, so this is this is attention economy. Uh, the idea is that your value is a function of how many people are uh, paying attention. And I think maybe the best example of this is uh, Twitch TV. Um, Twitch is a uh, gaming streamer uh, website. Um, so these are games. <coughs> Fortnite's the popular game right now. Let's see if uh, Ninja is playing. So uh, in 2018, people don't play games themselves. People watch other people play games. So this is a streamer, uh, Ninja. Uh, he's streaming uh, Fortnite, which is a very popular game right now. Um, and uh, if you saw down here, 108,000 people are watching him right now. Um, as I'm uh, playing this, uh, record, uh, recording this lecture, uh, there's 107,000 people watching him play this game. 107,000 people. They're not playing the game themselves. They're just watching this other person play the game. Why are they watching him? Well, because you know he's on stream. He interacts with uh, the chat. Um, uh, let me go back here. Um, on Twitch, there's a little uh, IRC chat where people can talk and post emoji and so on. Uh, and so the streamer talks to chat. Um, he uh, has engagement with them. Uh, they donate money directly to him. Uh, $3,000 someone donated uh, to him. So he gets money directly from his viewers, um, but they also contribute to his subscriber count and his viewer count, and he can run advertisements over his show um, that are shown directly to his uh, followers. And that's just one person, but anyone can do this if you have a computer, right? So you go to Twitch, and there's hundreds of people, thousands of people uh, streaming, um, any given game. Let's see. Uh, right now, there are uh, 25, uh, 250,000 viewers watching different Fortnite games. 100,000 of them are watching Ninja here, but 
lots of other people watching all these other so this is the long tail of viewers so there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people uh, streaming their video game plays that uh, maybe only a hundred other people are watching um, right, this is just some dude um, but he's got a hundred viewers maybe some of these people are are using bots to get these viewers but a lot of these viewers are legitimate and uh, people are just watching other people play play games uh, some of these people have very very few viewers um, but anyone can do this um, and people enjoy watching other people play games right, so this is, this is a, the attention economy um, uh, you might think that if someone just spends eight hours a day playing a game that they're lazy or that they're not being productive um, but they're creating content that other people enjoy watching um, and that's uh, it's, it's something that people value. It might not be a, a product that people are making or a, a consumable item, um, but it's uh, content that people can watch and enjoy, um, and they get they get paid for it. Uh, and right, so this is an example of the attention economy uh, actually being a, a legitimate economy. Um, uh, people like watching people play games. Uh, you know, there's I mean, you, people like watching the Olympics, for instance. Uh, people like watching experts. Uh, perform uh, at uh, high levels. Um, people also just like watching the games generally, so um, it's easier than playing the games. So this is an example of how uh, the attention economy um, is already sort of alive and well, and you might imagine more of this in the future, that people uh, earn their universal basic income in some way uh -huh, by streaming uh, their life by life, like, sort of life logging, or uh, making their data available uh, in in certain ways, um, in order to get uh, uh, to receive benefits from that. Um, we should be getting paid for the data that we're giving up uh, to Facebook and so on. Um, okay, uh, I'm starting to go into political rants, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, there's other resources in the slideshow. Um, one of the required readings is this video. I think it's about 15 minutes long. Um, CPG Gray, CGP Gray. Uh, humans need not apply. It's a really great introductory video to uh, technological automation. It goes through a lot of the discussion um, uh, that I started here. Um, another resource that you might enjoy, um, this is um, a quote from Bill Watterson that was uh, illustrated by another cartoonist. Um, the quote's uh, much longer than just these two panels. Um, uh, Bill Watterson is the cartoonist who made uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, and famously, after he made Calvin and Hobbes, um, he didn't allow any Calvin and Hobbes uh, merchandise except for the books. Um, but he didn't turn it into a movie. Um, he didn't sell the rights to any other um, media environment. Um, and then after Calvin and Hobbes was over, he just left cartooning. He retired. Um, and in this uh, comic, he discusses the value of uh, doing something that you care about, even if it's not making you a lot of money or um, climbing the corporate ladder. But the argument here is that there's other valuable things in life apart from um, uh, apart from your job, apart from your career, um, apart from uh, rising the corporate ladder. right? This is, I think, part of what's meant by um, uh, devaluing the work ethic. Right, I'm um, realizing that it's not uh, that the value in life isn't just what you get paid to do. Uh, it's sort of the value that you make for yourself, uh, and that might not be something that you get paid to do. Um, maybe the value that you find in playing a video game with your community of friends um, is satisfying enough, and if you have universal basic income supporting that, um, then that's all you really need to do, and that's satisfying life for you, um, or you know, making model dinosaurs or whatever. So. Um, Something to consider along the lines of technolo technological automation. Um, another source uh, that you might uh, consider is this hyper-reality video. It's this big video here. Um, it's This is an amazing video. It's one of my favorite videos. I think it's 2016 from Kichi Masuda. So uh, this is a VR, virtual reality, dystopian future video. I won't show the whole thing. I just want to show you just a few little clips of it. Um, uh, I think it's a great story of how technology is going to impact work, the kind of work that people do. Um, so watch the story, uh, watch the video, uh, tell me what you think about it. 
Um, Keiichi Masuda is awesome. Um, this is an earlier video from 2010 that he made um, that goes over the same kind of themes. It's sort of a precursor to this video. This is his major video, and from this uh, hyper reality video, uh, Keiichi, uh, Matsuda got uh, was hired by Leap Motion. Um, Leap Motion is the big AR um, company out in San Francisco. Um, and they're building some awesome things. So the guy who made this hyper-reality video is now working for an actual AR company. This, these are real demos of their AR software. So this, this, is, this stuff really works. Um, and we're going to see this stuff very soon, in the very near future. Uh, and it's really exciting. And Matsuda, um, he knows what's going on, and he anticipates a lot of these in this video. So uh, watch these videos and tell me what you think. Think about the future of work um, and how... Uh, automation and artificial intelligence is going to affect employment. Um, that's all I'm going to say for right now. I've been talking uh, for long enough. Um, thank you, uh, and I'll see you next week.